Paul Stonehill is my guest. He's co-authored a new book called UFO Case Files of Russia. Paul, great to have you on the program. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. I've been working on an expanded version of my research about Soviet Russian USOs, unidentified submersible objects. And one interesting confirmation came from a high Soviet naval official, uh, Admiral Chernavin, who said in reference to the instructions that had been given to the Soviet armed forces about detection and research of UFOs, he said that I know that the Americans have similar instructions for a fact and are using them. Now, I've never heard about the U.S. government actually issuing such instructions as the Soviets had, as you know, in their Sietka program, super secret research program that their military and scientists had conducted for over 13 years. Yet there is a Soviet uh, source, a credible one, who points out to the United States similar research. You know, I had the opportunity, Paul, as you know, to, to visit the uh, USSR or Russia, I should say, in the in the 90s a couple of times. And, and we were able to, to pry some of the uh, previously classified files out of some Russian military sources, and, and they didn't get killed as a result of it. I'd like to know, uh, but, but things have changed, and I'd like to know what the attitude of the Russian government might be now, uh, based on your sources and contacts, uh, toward this subject. Um, number one, under the current uh, regime, uh, Russia has been changing course. It's becoming a different sort of state. They have their own idea of democracy. But uh, because of that, not getting into politics, after all, I'm from Ukraine, so I may be subjective. Yes. But yes. <laughs> what happened is that what I find interesting is that, uh, of course, there is very little credible information coming out. But most important is that there is so-called disinformation coming out. And I was uh, astonished to find out last year uh, that Western media reported uh, news that Soviet Russian um, naval files on USOs and UFOs have been declassified, and, you know, you can read all about it. Then I started reading what's available, and I could see a rehashing of some of my articles, a little bit uh, more information, but nothing new. And I'm wondering, what's going on? Why? What is this story? What are they trying to achieve? In my opinion, they're hiding much more, and there is a lot to hide about the underwater phenomena, because things are happening quite a lot, including Mr., uh, you know, uh, well, let's say, including their um, uh, recent visit to the bottom of the lake by Cal. I'm sure the increased activity of the Russian Navy all over the world. Um, as a result, they will encounter more and more uh, interesting underwater phenomena, as they had before, as the so-called quackery phenomenon and more. You know, we are becoming more techn technologically capable of uh, reaching greater depths of the sea. And as a result, we are meeting more. And what's interesting, I, I, me and Philip, I and Philip just have a, a mantle. We have completed a few articles, including Soviet cosmonauts, uh, such as uh, recently departed uh, Pavel Popovich and uh, Mr. Leonov, who is still alive. And he, I was astonished to find out that uh, Popovich referred to an underwater base in the Indian Ocean. Now, he was in uh, he was insane mind, sound mind. He was a proud and capable Soviet cosmonaut uh, up to the day he died. And he had a lot of information. He was a personality who helped, helped, who helped Soviet ufologists uh, survive and gave them protection. He was the one that obtained KGB files about UFOs in the early 1990s. And here's a guy, here's a person who states with all authority that he knows about underwater bases in the Indian Ocean. Of course, he mentioned more than that. But well, you know, I, I know for uh, for a fact that uh, that Russian cosmonauts were trained to look at the oceans. They were they were uh, taught uh, techniques to look from space and spot American or detect American nuclear submarines. That was part of their training. So that might explain why a cosmonaut like him could look down there and see something like this. Absolutely, of course, they had detected much more. Anywhere we step into any subject about. Uh, you know, research of UFOs and UFOs in the former Soviet Union and Russia today, 
you know, you start getting information. Like cosmonauts, they had observed gigantic waves rising up in the ocean and smashing into each other and much more. Of course, a lot of the information that the cosmonauts had observed about, you know, let's say a paranormal phenomena, they couldn't reveal because they would lose their jobs. And yet some information came out, astonishing information. And some of them quite openly uh, admitted, uh, you know, that they believe in UFOs. They, some of them had seen it. UFOs had always been present over the sites of Soviet testing of their satellites and, uh, and space, um, uh, space vehicles. I'm going back to the 1950s. And the father of the Russian space program, uh, Sergei Karolyov, he was so much into study of the Tunguska phenomenon, for example, he gave his own money to, for, the, for the, some of the uh, researchers who later became cosmonauts to go to the site of the Tunguska to study it. It's all, it, you know, it, it's, like, you know an, an, it's like enigma wrapped in the mystery, I believe that's what Russia is referred to. Right. Anywhere you touch the Soviet and Russian UFO research, you find more mysteries, more enigma, and definitely whatever has come out, picture, you know, the picture is incredible of what they had studied, what they had found, and, of course, of what we don't know. Paul, as you know, uh, during the 90s, there was uh, Gorbachev and then Yeltsin and a brief uh, window of opportunity for the rest of the world to get a look at, at Russia and the, U the former USSR. Uh, perestroika, glasnost, mm -hmm. and that was a time when when uh, people started uh, delving into UFO secrets, among others, and, and some of those secrets uh, came spilling out. As you know, some of those people who talked about those things back then uh, have changed their mind. I'm thinking of Colonel Boris Sokolov, for example. And, you know, I can't blame him, you know, because you look at the government, the Putin government, and you see journalists being killed and and people getting into line and, and keeping quiet, and, and you, you can hardly blame them. That's why I started this conversation with asking you about the attitude of the Russian government toward uh, openness on this subject, and you're not optimistic. Well, yes, but at the same time, I want to show you other examples. Uh, I don't want to go to extremes, and the reason why is this. My, one of uh, my and Philip's greatest sources is Mikhail Gerstein. He's one of the best and brightest Russian ufologist today. He had written a number of books, interesting books, and he, you know, he, he destroys uh, hoaxes and frauds, and at the same time he brings a lot of information to the surface. And, you know, he has not been affected. I mean, I haven't heard from him for the last two months, but uh, maybe it's because, because of his situation, uh, economy-wise. However, then there is Colonel Ploxin, who was involved in the same research as Sokolov, and he was a little bit, you know, higher rank. He had revealed so much, not in the later years, not in the latest years, and at the same time, information came out. So I want to believe that Russia is not going back to communism or anything like communism. I know it's not what it, had, what it was in the 1990s, and I don't like that too. But I want to be optimistic that still information will come out. But let's also, here is my view. And people who read my books, my books and my, uh, and the books I wrote with Philip Mantle, will see that I don't want to shove down my expl explanations down anybody's throats. I want them to come up with their own ideas based on facts. And we present, you know, incredible amount of facts in the books. But my, sub my view is this, that the Soviets at the end had been as confused about UFOs as other governments. They have something in their hands, and we'll talk about it later, where, where this data and, and uh, let's say, credible information they have came from. But at the end, they had been very confused, and they wanted to find out what is going on. They knew that UFOs do not present an, a threat to, to their existence. At the same time, they had to know what they had been encountering, whether under the sea or in the sky or on land. As an example of confusion, Azhaza, one of the you know, top Soviet and Russian UFO researchers, he was, um, he was prosecuted, let's say. You know, he wasn't a dissident, but he suffered because of his interest in, in UFOs. And Communist Party officials made sure he lost jobs, he couldn't advance 
but he is friends in the Soviet Navy where he used to serve before. They had protected him. They gave him jobs, uh, you know, uh, uh, assignments to study UFO phenomenon, USO phenomenon, and to write about it. And he was the guy that wrote instructions under this Chetka program that you brought information about and I had written about. He was the guy who wrote the special instructions given to the Soviet armed forces to collect UFO information and to send it to the two secret institutes in Moscow and Leningrad. And so, so this shows you the disarray they had in the Soviet Union. They were confused and, I don't want to say scared, but definitely concerned about what's going on. They lost a few aircraft in the process of trying to touch UFOs. They lost, you know, some, some um, you know, army personnel and so forth. I don't think that there was their main concern. But the picture that comes out to me is this. UFOs, of whatever origin they were, were concerned about Soviet military experiments and their effect on ecology of the Soviet Union. And in some cases, this UFOs actually interfered to prevent further disaster, like in my Ukraine with the Chernobyl incident. I mean, there is credible information that it was a UFO that actually helped put down the flame, the you know, nuclear flame in the reactor. Uh, tell me this. Uh, you know that for a time there was a standing order uh, for the Russian military, in particular the Russian Air Force. If you encounter a UFO, leave it alone, uh, precisely because of the examples you mentioned, that there were encounters in which planes were lost. Yes. Do you happen to know whether that order is still in effect? I think so. I think so. I don't think that uh, that they would uh, go ahead and, 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 and you know attack something that they know would fight back. But here is what I noticed. Russia, not being a communist state, uh, whatever direction it takes today, today, it's not the same. That means there is less UFO reports coming from Russia. Or there are some, you know, that you can, uh, they're still coming, uh, some of them are very interesting, but not as much. However, China, you, there is so, much, so, so many reports of UFOs about China, it's, it's you know, it, it's fascinating. And uh, I, I, I just, uh, a few years ago, I published um, an article about UFOs over Sichuan province because I'm very much interested in China and their research and, you know, especially ancient U, UFO phenomena. And uh, it's incredible. Then we had a tragedy in Sichuan, of course, with the earthquake. But still, you have a great amount of reports coming from China. And I hope we'll get researchers from China who publish it in the United States. You've written this, uh, you've co-authored this new book called UFO Case Files of Russia. Uh, your co-author is Philip Mantle. What's new? What's in it that uh, is going to jump out at us and say, aha, that's why I have to have this book? We added quite a lot of information about, uh, first of all, Russian researchers uh, who, who, who are active, such as Gerstein, um, such as uh, Chernobyl, and those are very capable young um, scientists who uh, are dedicated to UFO research and no-nonsense approach to UFOs, and no politics, too, which is very important. And uh, there is much more information about the cosmonauts and what they had seen, some of the strange cases. Uh, you know, still, you're, you're, you, we're able to obtain information because our colleagues in Russia and, and other former Soviet republics who are no longer under the, let's say, Russian control. There is a lot of information coming out, and uh, given more time, I think we'll learn more. Do you have any indication that there are secret studies still underway, the kind that uh, that Sokolov presided over back in the 80s? No credible information, but uh, the, at the same time, again, because of the increase in secrecy, I would definitely not doubt that they do. I'll give you two examples. We talked about USOs. Again, right. there is this great interest in the Lake Baikal. This was mainly after, you know, I started publishing information about the so-called swimmers and the incident they had in 1982. I'm sure the Soviets have their own sources of knowledge, and they were interested. But there is something that bothers them about that lake. That's why, they, you know, one of the strangest lakes in the world. 
That's well, describe it for us. What, what do you mean? What, lake, what is it that's like strange? All, it's, it's a lake that has very unusual flora and fauna, and um, a report of uh, anomalous objects for centuries about that lake. There is also, uh, I believe, a um, hypothesis that the lake is connected uh, very deeply with, other, with seas and other bodies of water. Now, the, my, my story goes back to 1982 when the Soviets had detected uh, gigantic beings who could swim underwater, do whatever they had to do, humanoid beings, and uh, not use any breathing apparatus. They tried to capture them. As a result, the Soviets lost a number of troops. Well, how do you know this? Um, based on uh, several sources. One of them was the Soviet military um, officer, uh, Mark Steinberg. He lives in the United States, and a few other ones. But then I received a confirmation from uh, somebody who was uh, one of the most interesting Soviet writers and uh, a specialist in the Chinese language and Khrushchev's interpreter during 1950s. His name was Demidenko. Now, he did not know the author of, of, of this report, but he himself was at the, uh, in, in that part of the taiga, of the Russian taiga, and he was given confirmation before he read the report by local people who reported about this incident. Then I, I went deeper than that. I have reports from the, one of the Sietka um, uh, scientists, Yermilov, uh, same program that you brought information about. He is still very alive and active. Now, he reported, uh, he had reports from the Sietka program about a gigantic, similar, identical being that had been sighted near a body of water by Soviet soldiers and officials. And I, it's in my book. But also, I had confirmation from um, a report by Russian in, uh, military counterintelligence from the Far East which is not that far away from, from you know, Siberia, uh, about, uh, you know, similar beings they had cited. That was going back to the year 2000. Then I go more and more, and that, that, you know, that brings more information. They had other reports of USOs in deep water lakes and bodies of the, of, of the, U, of, you know, of the USSR. Something interesting. I told you about ecological uh, impact that we may have on our planet, and those who may be concerned about it, there is a lake in the Soviet Union uh, in, 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 in Central Asia where they had, uh, during the Cold War, a special tracking station to spy on American satellites, SDI program. And as a result of their observations, they found they saw disks, gigantic disks, going in and out of the bodies of that water, of, of that lake. Now, if, God forbid, that lake ever breaks through the dam that is there, billions of cubic feet of water will descend on countries below, Afghanistan, and so forth. So, well, we hope that doesn't happen. That uh, doesn't happen. So what's yeah. going on? That's another ecological impact, uh, and, and, and UFOs being so-called observers. Jeremy Corbell is a filmmaker with a passion for the weird. The Tic Tac UFO. Other than Robert Powell, whose uh, Facebook post of Friday we put uh, online on our uh, Coast to Coast website, other than him, I don't think ufology has written one word about uh, the Tic Tac UFO incident. And yet when it was announced on October 11th, the reaction was, eh, you know, that's kind of old news. As, as far as you know, has ufology, anybody there written, done anything with this case? No, it's it's actually really difficult. This case is is fundamentally difficult because it's a military UFO case and it's current. It's modern day. It's 2004, at least the one that is outwardly put on, on a blog. So this is a difficult case because it is current, because it's military. I personally have struggled with what information is classified and what is not. That was a huge gift given to the public by Chris Mellon. And people might have missed that point, but we're going to hit that tonight. Well, let's tell the story. What happened on that day? Your, your version of it, uh, or maybe you want to start with how you've got your way into this story. Sure. I mean, look, it was more than three years ago today, and I, I heard whispers of this story. I was tipped off in some way by sources. This is one of the most dramatic modern-day UFO and USO military encounters in, in modern history. 
this is an incredible case. I heard about it, but there was no public mention. And so those spider bots, you know, you put out little Google search terms and things ping back. So you get names like Nimitz, Princeton, 2004. And then all of a sudden, an article pops up. And this article, it tells the story from a firsthand experience through a friend of the pilot. And you can read all about it. And so that was really the genesis to start hitting this hard and trying to contact the principles of this story and learn as much as I could silently and under the radar before this got changed or distorted or twisted. So that was kind of my experience was I was lucky enough to kind of get tipped off on it. And then there was public mention and it was go time. It was time to start looking into this and finding out exactly what happened and who can I speak with. And what can I learn before the public knew about this, just to make sure it didn't get distorted? So did the uh, principals involved in this, the people who were actually hands-on eyewitnesses, did they know that announcement was coming? No. Actually, I was able to let them know, the people that I was in communication with, that this story was coming out. And odd, I thought, they, of course they would know, but oddly enough, uh, the, the, the main individual and the individuals involved in this case did not know that this was going to be publicly announced and handed on a silver platter to the public and also, you know, as you mentioned earlier in the show, to Congress as a way, as a push button for this other announcement. So, no, people were in the dark. Can you uh, sort of walk us through it? I, I know there is the version that appears in the in the magazine article of the story. There's a version that Chris Mellon told. There's a version that Robert Powell tells on that Facebook post. Can you walk us through the sequence of events uh, as best you know about what happened? Absolutely. I, I you know I have to say that most everybody got this wrong except for the first public mention, which was in that article that Chris Mellon referenced when he came on stage. What actually happened that day is something very different than what you're reading other than in that blog report. So, you know, let's start from the, the very beginning. First of all, something that, that's not understood, this is not an isolated event. Between November 10th and November 14th of 2004, there was a series of events involving the Nimitz Carrier Strike Group that took place. And that's just off the coast of San Diego. And essentially, there was uh, just phenomenal aerial, the, the, you know, they call them AAVs. This is something I've kept to myself for quite some time, anomalous aerial vehicles. That is an intelligence term used similarly to UAP, which is the new version of UFO, right? But that is the term that is used. So on these days leading up to the 14th, which is the report that we know about in the blog, there were a number of, of, of these, you know, contacts. So, you know, the fire control officer and the fire control senior chief, they had detected multiple returns descending far above, like, the radar that they had, the scan volume, which was 80,000 feet or higher. And these targets that were dubbed anomalous era vehicles, they would drop down from 80,000 feet and hit and hover at 50 feet above the water in a matter of seconds. So just imagine NORAD or imagine any of our, you know, really complex radar systems looking at this. This looks like a threat. This looks like ICBMs coming into our atmosphere. So this was, this raised a lot of alarms. A lot of people knew about this and it was happening for multiple days. And then we get the report and this is the report that's online. It was written by a man named Paco. And, you know, he himself, you know, he flew um, A6E intruders, F-14As, Tomcats. Uh, you know, he had 10 years active duty. This is a guy who's also very qualified as a pilot. And he's writing this in an, an obscure aviation blog. And he's writing about a friend of his. And all of this is public and you can read it. So I'm not saying anything new in this. But he talks about a primary pilot who had direct engagement with this object. Direct engagement, meaning what? Meaning, well, you can read about it in the blog, but meaning when he came in, you know, he, he was out on a normal mission, a normal day, and he's going out from the Nimitz, and he's doing his routine, uh, you know, operations. 
and he essentially gets a call asking what ordinance that he has on board his plane, which was a strange request because he's right off the coast of California. So he replies back, says what ordinance he has. He's given coordinates, and he's said to go basically investigate. So there he goes, and he rolls up on this object. And this object, you know, first thing is, this is an object. It was specifically uniformly white. It was, that's why they call it the Tic Tac. It was about 46 feet long, which is like roughly fighter jet size. In fact, these are some details that, that are not publicly said, but it, it, was, it had a discernible midline, a horizontal axis, like a, like a fuselage, but it had no visible windows, no propulsion systems, no heat exhaust. We're, we're looking at this, or he was looking at this through, through FLIR. FLIRs are highly advanced, forward-looking infrared radiometer. It's, it's thermal. It's a thermographic camera. I mean, it, it, it detects things in 3 to 12 micrometers. It's this incredible technology that we have. So he's looking at this object, and it's sitting there, just hovering. Below this object is a large 747-size dark USO, unidentified submerged object. The water was churning. It was just churning in a circle. And I'm just giddy right now because I came on last time to Coast to Coast. I couldn't say any of this. I mean, I was only essentially putting a fish hook out to see if one in a million chance I could get some other contacts in this case. And sure enough, after the broadcast, I got further contacts in this case. So this is so exciting. So there it is. There's this USO churning water, and this tic-tac, as they call it, was essentially docking. It was docking with this other object, for, for lack of a better word, and it took off. It took off blinding speed. Not only do we have a fighter pilot who is you know, highly credited, is an, a trained observer, we have footage, and that's something that's super interesting. That's something that was promised, actually, by Chris Mellon and his whole group, was that there would be this clear military footage. But I myself was worried about classification of this footage as I was investigating it. So you had it, but you couldn't say you had it. I did. And now it's out there. Now, this morning, like a gift from above, it came out online. I confirmed this was, in fact, the direct footage from the pilot, from the fighter pilot. This is real footage of an AAV anomalous aerial vehicle, like a UAP or UFO, something that uses non-traditional propulsion that is not like anything that we on Earth have. You know, I'm not a pilot. I don't know how to interpret the images I saw, but I watched the film today, of course, and, and um, I mean, you obviously have seen it multiple times. What do you make of it? Yeah, so you have to understand the, the, the footage in its context. So as I was saying before, and, and this is really interesting, there's footage from this FLIR system, but when the pilot went to engage this object, the object actively jammed all the weapons systems. And this is a modern fighter pilot, a modern fighter plane. This thing actively jammed all those systems. But we do have this FLIR footage, so it looks black and white. But you have to understand, you can read altitude, you can read time. You can see velocity in this. This video, when analyzed appropriately by people who know what they're looking at, I mean, this is huge that it got out. I don't know if it's classified. I don't know if it should be classified. That was my dilemma. I couldn't even show it to the primaries in the case that I was talking with because I didn't know if I had something that shouldn't be shown. But it is, in fact, now out and people can analyze it. And so you're, you're worried about showing it, sending it to the primary witnesses, and it's something that they should not have, and if they had it and it's still classified, they could get in trouble for it. Absolutely correct. Now, here's the deal. That, that's speculation. But, you know, I like to work as a journalist from the point of, okay, this is, you know, what is legal that I can do, and then this is what is 
illegal. So my problem that I had even last time I was on, that is something I haven't told anybody until today. So in fact, yes, I had the footage for a long time. And this footage was leaked onto YouTube in the early days of YouTube. And they would share it and pass it around. But people couldn't screen grab these images or these videos as easily as they could today. So the big question was, is this classified? Now, I know there was at least one intelligence report done. I believe it was by the DIA. And essentially, they looked into this in 2007. And you know, from there, it, it, it wasn't clear if this footage was classified or not. But at this point, it's out again, not by my hand. So I can talk about it. You can see it. It will be analyzed. And so did you run it by your primary witnesses to say, hey, is this what you saw that day? Absolutely, I did. And 100% confirmed that is the video. That is the same video that came out, was leaked onto YouTube somehow in a mysterious way, originally back in 2004, I believe. So right around that time or just after that time, this is the video. You are seeing the real deal. When you so uh, tell, tell me a little bit about approaching these witnesses. Um, you know, these guys have security clearances, um, top secret stuff, and I would imagine they're a little afraid to talk to somebody they don't know about these things. Yeah, I, you know, I always kind of reflect on this. You know, you get some guy calling you. You look him up online. He makes UFO films, and, you know, I'm bearded with tattoos. I mean, honestly, I, I find it hard that people will talk with me. But, you know, over time, you know, they will begin to realize that I'm not somebody who's just going to come in and, like, take their story or break their trust. So I, I, I have earned the respect and I've earned the, the situation where people will talk to me usually. It doesn't always happen, but, but also I am genuinely curious about this. And you know what? Anybody who's seen something like the Tic Tac or anybody who's been involved in this experience – you know, they are also genuinely interested. And so that, I think, bonds us over time. But it takes years sometimes to have these types of relationships. Uh, it just does. So it's, it's touch and go. You know, the, the article that was on that fightersweep.com, um, there I was, the X-Files edition. These guys are serious dudes. I mean, these pilots, they're the, they're the best the best and the brightest, and and there they are encountering something that they don't want to admit is real, and they kind of dance around it in that language in the article, but they're telling us, hey, this is real. I I wonder if you get the same sense in talking to the primary witnesses, um, what they make of this. Absolutely. I mean, I asked, you know, a a question like, so you you don't really know what you saw, and I got a quick response. I know what I saw. I'm telling you what I saw. I know what I saw, but there still looms this question. You know what you saw, but what does it mean? What, you know, what, what are the implications of what you saw? And that, that's the hard part. You can, you can describe specifically, as I told you before, what this thing looked like. No wings, no traditional propulsion systems, look like an oblong, 46-foot long, porcelain white with a horizontal axis like a fuselage. But, but what does that mean when you see this thing zip away and outrun anything that we have in known technology? That piques the curiosity of any human being. And do they answer you? Do they go as far as to say what they think it is? You know, of course, we talked about speculation with, with any of the witnesses involved with this case that I spoke with. There is speculation on what it could be. But uh, that, that comes down to personal understanding, personal belief. It definitely defied all known characteristics of modern propulsion by any means. I know at one point, I guess a, a radar operator on the, one of the ships, maybe it's the Princeton, relays that it, it's, is in communication with the planes, and he says this thing just disappears, and then all of a sudden it reappears in a very strange place. So this, this object that we're calling the Tic Tac, and again, I want to repeat, this is not an isolated incident. We know that this was going on from the 10th through the 14th. I'll go a little further and say that off the coast of California was not the only incident of the Tic Tac 
appearing, this sort of thing appearing. But on that day, it was vectored by the Princeton and Banger. Okay, so these are two, cis, or, you know, two ships that basically, from what I understand, were able to catch this thing on radar. Russia is a tough nut to crack when it comes to UFOs, and uh, believe me, I've tried. It's, uh, you know, is it disinformation? Whatever you get out of them, can you trust it? Uh, is it fantasy? Paul Stonehill was born in Kiev, the USSR, and emigrated to the U.S. in 1972. Uh, in his younger days, he helped smuggle people out from behind the Iron Curtain. He aided dissidents, smuggled banned literature into the USSR, He's worked as a journalist covering warfare and UFO and anomalous phenomena, and he created or founded the Russian Ufology Research Center. You've probably seen him on various uh, Western uh, TV programs that uh, deal with the UFO subject. Uh, he's been here before, but it's been way too long. Paul, good to have you back. Hi, how are you? Thank you for having me back. Did you see this uh, article in the Moscow Times uh, recently, the headline included the phrase "Little Green Men." A look at the official Soviet X Files. It, it it included sort of a rewriting of what we know about modern UFO history in the USSR or in Russia since the USSR. A lot of stuff that I found to be hard to swallow. And I just wanted to see if if Paul, you had the same reaction, and then Rich, get your reaction to it if you've read it. There's a lot of um, misinformation. And also, Russia now knows what tabloid, you know, ufology is. So, you know, you, now it's even harder to go through the cases so, uh, because people have learned to lie. I mean, when the Soviet Union was a virgin territory, uh, you know, in the late 1980s, and a lot of information started coming out after they allowed the terminology like UFO to be officially recognized. We received a lot of interesting information, and uh, I would say it continued to at least 1993, 1994, when you brought out a lot of stuff, very interesting materials. And actually, I wanted to start today by getting you involved, because among the information you brought out was the 1982 case in Ukraine. You remember when there was almost a nuclear war oh, yes. incident? And the reason I am mentioning it is because, uh, you know, when people read our book, they will find a lot of interesting things, and they will make a lot of their, you know, I'm sure they'll make their own conclusions. But you can see some of the interesting underlining patterns that are coming out. And 1982, the year of 1982, was quite significant in the USO on identifying uh, submersible objects history as seen by Soviet uh, Navy people, and around the world. The Falklands War, 1982, was a very interesting case because it brings us into the Antarctic angle of our research, which is tremendously important. Other cases took place in 1982. In our book, and we'll get to it, uh, the famous uh, now story of the so-called swimmers in the Lake Baikal was also 1982. The case that, you know, you helped bring out from the Soviet Union, 1982, uh, that, uh, you know, nuclear incident, the almost nuclear incident, happened the same year. By the way, I have confirmation, um, you know, if you ever need to know from people who actually served and are not, not afraid to name their names, uh, you know, in, in media. Uh, you know, actual people who had served in Ukraine at that time, I had seen, you know, everything that was in the documents you brought out and more. Well, that's that's interesting. I, I think you and I need to have a conversation when we're not on the air. I've, I've got the names of the people that, that were involved in some of the documents. I never wanted to mention them because I didn't want to get them in trouble. Um, Rich, I'm going to ask you the same question as Paul. I don't know if you saw this Moscow Times article, but I, I, I ask it from the perspective of an historian because it seemed to me that there was a, a concerted effort in this to rewrite history, to, to put a new spin on it. And I've seen it before dealing with Russia. Um before I went over there in the in the 90s a couple of times, there was an article by a guy named James Oberg, who is, by any stretch of the imagination, a, a skeptic, an American skeptic. But he said, oh, you got to be careful about anything that comes out of Russia about UFOs because, you know, they've been deprived of information for so long, uh, they'll believe anything. And it was it almost seemed to me like a preemptive strike. If there's going to be a leak, don't believe it. And then after the the documents that we got came out, 
Mm-hmm. There was a spin again. There was a Colonel Sokolov, the guy who was at the Ministry of Defense, was described as a Russian ufologist. And now we have a new one. We have a the new spin is Yuli Platov, this guy from the Academy of Sciences. Sure. He was in charge of the investigation, in charge of the whole thing that was done by the the Russian military, and that's just simply not true. So I, I just wonder if, if you could sort of mm-hmm. look at the the big picture on how history gets rewritten, especially in the former USSR. I, I do recall reading that, George and Paul, and, and it's, it's not right in, right in direct front center of my mind at the moment, but I do recall this, and, and um, it is always, it's true, like what you find is how um, there's, there's, a, a power, there's a decision that is made editorially with uh, most of the uh, powerful news organizations at some point or another, to shoot down these uh, various UFO cases. Oberg is, I think, very well known as a skeptic who, uh, I think you're exactly right, was taking a preemptive strike at, uh, at the, the Soviet and Russian cases. And I, I, have, I have found that there's not a single important UFO case that has ever taken place, which at some point the skeptics don't put in their crosshairs to try to shoot down. It's a constant effort. They never, never cease at it. And it reinforces my own conclusion that what we call the mainstream media, um, from wherever it is, is, has this concerted effort continually to dismiss and to minimize the UFO subject and uh, to make it as though it's really not anything that significant, to plant the seed of doubt in the reader's mind that there's something going on and so forth. Uh, basically to keep stalling the engine every time we start it up. So I think it is part of a long-standing pattern. Um, Omni Magazine published an article about my work in 1993. Yes. Uh, and after that, James Oberg's uh, article came out. I don't want to waste my time talking about, about James Oberg. <laughs> He's not worth it. Yuri Platov is basically the same, but he had been consistently anti-UFO research. And he had never would hide his disgust or, you know, of, of people like, uh, uh, you know, people, actual researchers in the Soviet Union. But he, he was, you know, Sokolov, that was something else. He changed his opinion. He was the man uh, who actually, he was the person who investigated that 1982 incident, the nuclear incident uh, in Ukraine, and he was on site. He changed his opinions uh, after some years. Uh, due to the reasons we don't do not know, but he was not always, let's say, uh, describing incidents like this as something that uh, happens in the atmosphere, a uh, natural explanation. So, you know, there are many vicious games around the field of ufology in the Soviet Union and Russia today. Uh, you know, in the Soviet Union, um, they wanted to know um, it, it, it's like a Russian saying we have that a dog who sleeps on the hay would not others enjoy it, and at the same time it doesn't enjoy it itself, because you had people who wanted to know what the heck was flying over Soviet nuclear power stations, uh, military bases, submarine depots, and so forth. They needed to know. This was their duty, and uh, this is what they, they, you know, what they were called to to to, to know when they served. In their armed forces. At the same time, you had bureaucrats from scientific field who wanted, to, uh, you know, who didn't want to stir anything. And at the, at, at the other angle, you have the Communist Party who were afraid to say that anything like UFOs existed, and all you had was bourgeois inventions, you know, enemy, uh, you know, subversion, and so forth. And they would put down UFO researchers. I mean, they made their lives very miserable. And I have to give it to the people. Not always perfect, but good people who stood up like Ziegel, like Willenbach, like many others, and they were doing their research. And because of their, uh, you know, tenacity, we have a lot of information today. You know, the Soviet Union was a very, it was a very bad system, and it destroyed initiative. Yet there were people who put their own initiative online, and sometimes their livelihood and freedom and because of them, we know about UFO cases today. If I just may add an observation to that, to, to Paul, uh, and, and uh, if I just may mention this, George, uh, one of the things that comes out with, with, with Paul's and Philip's book, 
uh, Russia's Uf USO secrets is, um, you know, in contrast to what James Oberg described, you know, the, the Soviet UFO witnesses being, uh, you know, willing to believe everything and so on. What you find in, in this, their research, in, in Paul's and Philip's research and in this book, is exactly the opposite. You find that uh, there are many military personnel, scientific personnel, highly qualified individuals who have had uh, sightings and experiences over the decades, over the generations, that are every bit as baffling uh, and, and even sometimes more dramatic, or every bit as dramatic, if not more, than some of the best-known cases in the United States and other parts of the world. And, you know, and the reactions are exactly what you would expect um, from any other nation. You know, many of the Soviet cases, they would have an encounter in the middle of, let's say, the Atlantic Ocean. There was one that, uh, that Paul and Philip wrote about from 1965. Perhaps Paul will discuss it. But they were out in the middle of uh, in the Atlantic Ocean ready for a rendezvous with another ship. Submarine surfaces. Uh, the uh, crew members are looking, taking in some fresh air, and suddenly this cigar-shaped object silently is coming through the sky. Uh, they're wondering, my goodness, is this is this American? Uh, they wanted to dive the submarine immediately, but the radar wasn't recording anything. The captain decides we're going to remain on the surface and look at this, and suddenly they see three beams of light shoot out from this whatever this is. And it, this allowed the Soviet crew to, to look at the object, which looked uh, a little bit like an airship, but there was no markings uh, that they could see. It was very large, maybe uh, uh, 200, 250 yards or meters long, was, you know. And, yep. um, and they knew that there were no, no airships or dirigibles that the Air Force had that were any, anything like this size. And, and then what they noticed that really disturbed them is that this object descended uh, to the surface of the ocean and then with its lights on, and then it goes under the water. Uh, I mean, this is just, you know, one drop in the bucket, as it were, of the story. That's the thing that I actually loved about this book is so many of these bizarre encounters that Really, you just I've never heard of uh, nearly any of these, but um, and and they were they were gathered together within a system that really was uh, totalitarian, essentially, uh, in which secrecy prevailed, in which uh, these stories had to, to circulate quietly for many years. It's not a satisfying situation, but uh, as Paul points out, you know you make do with what you've got and you collect these stories. Uh, one final uh, point on this the discussion, the general discussion. I mean, I am so impressed, uh, Paul, by your work and, and the ufologists that came before you, investigators before you. I mean, for decades, as you point out in the book, these guys risked their lives to chase this stuff. The official edict from the uh, the Communist Party was, don't talk about this stuff. You're not supposed to. At the same time, publicly, they were, they were threatened with, if you get out of line, you could go to the gulag. It's not like here in, in the U.S. where... You can get your phone tapped. You can be, um, you know, uh, the target of ridicule. You could really pay the price over there and still the interest and the research continued. And yet, uh, you know, now you have history being rewritten. This article uh, that I was talking about saying that Colonel Sokolov uh, said in the end that there's no evidence uh, to support that it's alien visitation or something unknown, which is, you know, you can try to rewrite it in a newspaper article, but when you got the guy on camera saying exactly the opposite of that, it's very difficult for him. Or, you know, Yuli Platov making fun of Felix Ziegel, the father of, yeah. of Russian ufology. He wasn't much of a scientist, this guy says. You know, it's a cheap shot at yeah. somebody who's no longer around. Um, what You know what? He can, Platov can say whatever he wants. You look at the... Uh, Motion pictures, no, not motion pictures, so but documentary films that were shown, for example, on Russian television about USOs, as an example. And you have admirals and captains, former captains, uh, Navy personnel coming and speaking out what they had seen, what they had observed. No Yuri Platov can come anywhere close. They can try to rewrite ufology, but they cannot, because you have very active people like, uh, for example, Vadim Chernobrov, 
uh, and uh, Mikhail Gerstein, and they will speak, uh, you know, they, they will fight it, and they have. And um, there's another good saying, uh, you know, in, in, in Russia and Ukraine, uh, you know, which goes like this, you know, uh, the caravan moves on while the dog is barking. <laughs> so the dogs, yeah, trust me, you know, the dogs will bark, yet we have to go ahead and move on. And I got to tell you, you know, you're, it, it's good that you're worried about that. And I'm sure, you know, there are many battlefronts still in front of us because there's a lot of incredible information that uh, some entities try to uh, simply, uh, you know, keep silent. But they can't. They can't. And uh, you will see, for example, you know, in our book, we try to show different cases and different episodes. Yeah, we're talking about this 1965 case that Rich mentioned in the Atlantic Ocean where they were very close to the U.S. shores and were afraid. But at the same time, a similar case from 1965 about a gigantic cigar-shaped object was reported over the lake by Cal. Uh, you know, a silent uh, moving object over the lake, which was noticed by military people and reported so. And that's the beauty of it, because you have highly trained, uh, very professional uh, armed forces, Navy, Navy personnel, Air Force, and so forth, who had to record such incidents, because the Soviets simply became mad about all the situation that were, was taking place around them. And like I said, the military people said, we need to have information. So as an example, what happened, as you know, they had to create a scientific research program, which was completely secret for 13 years. And there were two different branches involved, the military branch and the scientific officialdom. And, of course, the scientists, for the most part, involved, like Platov or Megulin and others, they didn't want to do anything. They, they wanted to uh, bring out conventional explanations. But it wasn't good enough for the military who had to respond, what the hell is flying over our airfields? Why are Soviet space tests, you know, for spaceships and so forth, are always accompanied by UFOs? What is it that is moving, you know, in the oceans at incredible speeds, like 370 knots? We, can, we can't. We can't even come close to such speeds. Of course, scientists couldn't explain it away. There were some good scientists, let's say people who really wanted to do research, and they were, you know, being pushed aside. But military people got very agitated because they wanted to know what's going on. And, as you will find out in our book, uh, you know, such uh, important people like Admiral Gershkov forced creation of special, highly professional military scientific teams who had to study UFO, USO aspects out in the sea, on land, and so forth. So I, I don't want to get you know, uh, ahead of myself, but you will see it in our book, and you will see a lot of correlations. But please understand, we only describe cases that had been cited in the Soviet waters, Russian waters before then, and what the Soviet and Russian uh, Navy people had seen in international waters. You know there were thousands of cases all over the world about USOs, and... Uh, you know, I'm just glad we were able to bring all this information from the Russian territories. Because, you know, I'm, a lot of it, you will find out, a lot of it happens in China, in the Sea of Japan, and so forth. But through the Russian sources, we are glad that we could show people what's really going on in our oceans. Well, it's amazing. There's some amazing cases that I have never heard about before that you've, I don't know how you dug all this stuff up, but it's an amazing array I suppose, you know, we can also talk about the general premise, the idea that the Earth is covered by, you know, 70 percent water. So it makes sense that if you're looking for unidentified objects, flying or submersible objects, you'd look in the oceans. And uh, and uh, Rich, we can talk about the speculation that maybe the U.S. Navy is where some of these secrets are hidden in our country. And certainly it would make sense that that was true in Russia. A couple of weeks ago, we got a call during open lines and somebody said, hey, have you heard about this strange story off the coast of Malibu? check in uh, something that's there's some kind of underwater base there or something i said well we're going to check into it and uh, and we have a little more than six miles off the coast of malibu california a very unusual looking structure sits at the seabed floor based on images obtained on google earth 
the oval-shaped object has a huge flat top and what appears to be pillars or columns that seem to reveal the entrance to a darker inner place. The anomaly, for the moment, is approximately 2,000 feet below the surface of the water, measuring nearly three miles wide. What the heck is this thing? There is a video and a picture that you can look at at coasttocoastam.com in our highlights reel. Now, also according to the website of the California-based radio program Fade to Black by Jimmy Church, that it could be very well the holy grail of UFOs. So who knows? But one of those who's been watching this for some time, Robert Stanley, and he's my guest next. Currently an author, talk show host in his own right, serves as a correspondent for America's Morning News, and for the past 30 years, he has been looking for very controversial subjects. couple books out, Covert Encounters in Washington, D.C., Close Encounters on Capitol Hill, both stories we've talked about here on Coast to Coast. And here's Robert Stanley to tell us about this apparent underwater base near Malibu. Robert, welcome back. What a mystery. Yeah, hi, George. Uh, nice to speak to you again. You too. Now, you've been looking at this, though, for a long time. Tell me what you think this is. Yeah, well, I mean, Jimmy Church broke the story this year. However, I first noticed that on Google Earth Images back in 2010, and I emailed it around to some people, but I didn't post it on the Internet until yesterday. Um, And I actually, I had pinned it on Google Earth and named it the platform. Um, I know a lot of people are speculating it's a UFO base. I don't know that there's any evidence directly for that. However, I can tell you that... um, In the course of about 10 years, I had more than a dozen close encounters with UFOs at that location, or I should say the mountains, just due west of that anomaly that's under the water there. Um, And i got to tell you something else, too. I spoke to a friend of mine, an old friend that lives in Malibu near that, that whatever that is under the water. He told me that he's known for 10 years that thing was there. He said... He said, it is a UFO that is parked there. It's a massive UFO that's parked there. And at first I scoffed at that and thought, that's silly. But then I realized, wait a minute. The, if you look at that thing, it is absolutely geometrically perfect. And that shouldn't, if that was just a mound that somebody built a long time ago and it right. was submerged, it should have eroded by now. Because uh, it looks like it's been there a while. I mean, I'm guessing it's been, who knows for sure, but... Um, it is a very, I've been looking at the pictures that you sent us, Robert, all yeah. day. Yeah. It is a very strange looking. <laughs> it, it actually looks like a huge carton turned upside down of a chicken pot pie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's got those little indentations around it and everything yeah. else. It's really strange. I mean, it doesn't look natural, that's for sure. No, it's very geometrically perfect, and it doesn't look connected. That's the other thing. When When my friend said... It's a, it's a very large saucer, and the story gets weirder. He is a ham radio operator. He said that he's been uh, recording signals coming from that direction on his property for some time now. Oh, that's strange. And, and he, it's, he said it's in the 12-meter band, and it shouldn't be there. And, um, yes, Point, Point Magoo Naval Base is right there, but he, he's a retired military guy. He should know these things. So, anyway, he's promised to send me a copy of some of these signals that he's captured. So God only knows where this story is going, George. It, it just gets weirder and weirder every day. Now, w- what I depict when I look at this, mm-hmm. an object that is under a lot of sand on the bottom of the ocean floor, Yeah, d- it looks covered up to me. How about you? Yeah, that's what I was saying. If, at first I thought that's silly, you know, a giant UFO on the ocean floor. And then I thought, no, wait a minute. Yeah, like if they built it out of cement, then it probably, if that really is a man-made structure, which I assume it is, um, it would have to be something really solid. It couldn't be just like, you know, the mounds we see in Ohio. It That's have right. To, right. It would have to be something that was incredibly durable. Um, and it does look like it's covered over a silt. But again, it's so perfect. You know, the other thing we, I think we should really tell people is that those are not photographs. In my understanding, those are sonar scans. And um, th- so uh, there's a lot of detail that's missing there, the, and and I think people are reading a lot into it. And somebody's been messing with the uh, imagery from the Navy. I've noticed since, I mean, I've been looking at the 2009 stuff that I captured 
back in 2010. I looked at the 2012 images I captured, uh, screen captured, and now I'm looking at the 2014 images, and they, they seem to be slightly altered. But I've also looked back on some older, um, uh, what do you call it, um, underwater maps, uh, you know, like to topographical, I think they call bathymetric for the, uh, the topography of the ocean floor there. It, and some of those old maps already show that. Whatever that there, it's been there for at least, you know, 30, 40 years. Has anybody gone down there? It's 2,000 feet down. <laughs> Has anybody it, gone down there that we know of? I, I'm certain the, na the Point Magoo has a naval base there and a submarine, uh, an active submarine fleet is based right there. So they come out from Point Magoo, um, and then they go down a submarine trench, and they go right by that thing on a regular basis. So, yeah, I'm sure the Navy knows about it, but they, if, you know, whatever they've discovered, they're not sharing publicly. All right, Robert, it's 2,000 feet below the surface. How far out is it from shore? Uh, I didn't do the exact measurements, but it's really not that far. I mean, um, it's just uh, it's part of the, the, the shelf there. Uh, the continental shelf, but it's it's actually pretty close. Okay, so could it have been part of California that may have oh, broken absolutely. off a long, long time ago? Yes. Well, okay, that got submerged. I mean, this is part of the the rest of the story that I find so intriguing. There, uh, the legends of the native people there, the Shumash, say that there was a first people that lived in a coastal valley right there, uh, which it, 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 it they got flooded out, probably. 11, 12,000 years ago, there was a flood, and they got wiped out. And so... Uh, we could probably use some of that flood now. Huh? <laughs> you guys, yeah, definitely, definitely need some rain. Uh, but not that much rain. I mean, uh, supposedly at the end of the last ice age, the, 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 the uh, what do you call it, the sea levels rose like 200, 300 feet. That's why um, on the Channel Islands you found that there were mammoths that, that uh, were stranded out there, and then they... Over the generations, they became much smaller. They call them pygmy mammoths. And, and um, so there was, you know, there's a lot of artifacts. In fact, the oldest remains in North America of humans are right there on the Channel Islands. They're at least 11,000 years old. So there's, there's something really ancient about the, that location. And more importantly, if you've looked at my website recently, there are what appears to be megalithic monuments due west of that anomaly under the water. Up in the mountains adjacent to it, there are these ancient rock walls and massive uh, stone statues up there. Are you tipping toward man-made or extraterrestrial origin? For the, the, the room, structure, yeah. Uh, I would have to say they're man-made, but based on what's been, what I've experienced up there, it seems like, just like we have now, there probably was a lot of UFO activity or star people coming and interacting with our ancestors, probably set up a colony here a long time ago, um, and uh, they've been interacting with us sometimes overtly. A lot of times it's covertly, but they're definitely here. So I assume that they were not only here now, I I'm sure they were there here and back in the back, you know, way back when. Well, it's it's strange, and you know, even a small submersible doesn't have to be part of the navy. Right, can get down there and take pictures. I mean, we need to get <laughs> somebody down there. Yeah, I think at some point people are so intrigued. I mean, you know, the other thing that I did finally is I put the in, I've, I've actually put maps. Uh, and driving instructions for anybody who wants to go up and see these statues up in the mountains of Malibu, uh, that is now available. It used to be you'd have to contact me and I would send you the stuff, but now it's available to everybody because I think it's time. It's time for people to reconnect with our ancient heritage. Um, I think that's going to have a huge impact on helping not only rewrite history, but reconnecting humanity with its, its, its roots. Are there other structures like this around the planet, Robert? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, depending on the age we're talking about here. But down in Peru, there's a place called Marcawasi, a very high coastal plateau. And those statues are uh, less defined, but they're, but they're still intriguing. And uh, there's a lot of, lot of uh, research on this uh, that's available on the Internet. You can just look for yourself. I know Bill Cody did a fantastic uh, documentary of it, 
years ago, and um, it's I think it's out now. So it's it, yes, absolutely. There's enigmatic stone statues that are unaccounted for as far as you know our current narrative about how we got here. Um, it's I think it's it's missing a lot of pieces, you know, unfortunately. So we're, we have some some homework to do here, uh, sort of play catch up on who we really are, how we got here, and how old is our is our human culture. It's just amazing to see these structures and then try to imagine civilizations vibrant and living there, and then something happens, a catastrophe. And, and i got to believe, Robert, whatever happened, yeah, it happened quickly, didn't it? it? Typically, yeah. And that seems to be, you know, David Children, just as a friend of mine, we've talked about this. He said this publicly. There is a huge divide between people who are on the side of gradualism, they think everything just happens really slowly, and of course the layers, the tertiary layers, are, they measure it and they go, well, this was so many years ago. But if it happened very quickly, catastrophism is definitely, I mean, you could actually have both, okay? You could have gradualism for a period of time, and then a catastrophe occurs. So, there, like I said, there's a, uh, there's a lot of components here that we need to uh, take into consideration when we're looking at the past. And catastrophes would certainly explain, like the Younger Dryas event, that that damn, that almost wiped out humanity, really. I mean, that is the like a biblical flood kind of thing where there's only a handful of people left. At this point, do you think there's anything to do with UFO activity in this region? In Malibu? Yeah. yeah absolutely. As I said, I've experienced it uh, more than a dozen times right there. For sure, there's a portal of some kind. And um, <clears throat> those things are all over the planet. As I reported to you last time we yeah. spoke, there's for sure we you know there's they're they're all over the planet, and Malibu is just one of those locations. Washington D.C. is too. I don't know if these things are natural or artificial or probably both. I assume they could be both, um, but that's why I was saying I'm, I don't think there has to be a base in Malibu in order for the UFOs to be coming in and out. Just just like Washington D.C., these things are appearing like just a hole in the sky. They just pop right through and pop back out and. Um, uh, God knows exactly where those things lead to, but um, it would uh, just say it would alle- alleviate the need for uh, having a full-blown base here. So, so the UFOs, though, and what people are beginning to see in that region may yeah. not have any direct correlation to the structures under there. Uh, no, but as I, okay, a lot. Some people, I should say, have seen them going in and out of the water. Um, and I know Bill Burns has done some work on that, um, the USO stuff, uh, yeah. Catalina as well as Malibu. And, um, yeah, I mean, there's something out there, absolutely. There's something up in the mountains, too. And, I, I mean, I took people up there. I'm not the only one. I, had, I brought friends with me, and I actually used to give tours there. And at night, there were UFOs that showed up right there. At, at, you know, the Point Magoo Naval Base is tracking this stuff. We know that for sure. That's part of the historical record. Ever since they put a radar tracking system there for the missiles that they launch, uh, they're, they've, they're, they're getting UFOs, too, as well. Well, it's a heavy activity area. There's, yeah. a, there's no doubt about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, and, in terms of the Uf, UFO activity, specifically, yeah. what are people seeing? What are they reporting? It, it kind of runs a gambit, but I mean, I can really say for myself that we've, and I, I mean, I would, it, it, sometimes they just appear out of nowhere. Other times it looks like they're dropping out of the sky, stopping, beaming lights at us. Um, uh, one time, it was the amazing, most amazing thing I've ever seen, actually, uh, as far as close encounters. It, it, it was, uh, it just appeared. And I think it was there the whole time, but it just turned on its light. It looked like a, a, a white snowball kind of a thing where, in other words, the air around it was completely like a sparkler, except in 360 degrees. And it went from white, red, yellow, blue, green, purple, and then faded out as it was moving from right to left in front of us. I mean, it, and we were on top of the mountain peak, uh, as they say, looking out at the ocean, um, right where that anomaly is there at Point Magoo. Robert, uh a couple uh, days ago, Sci-Fi Channel, uh, in the 45th anniversary of the landing of the moon, I saw uh, that. had that show on. Yeah, that was uh, good. It, it was a good show, and Robert Kiviat, an old friend of ours, put that together. He did a good job with that. Yep. 
And, you know, there's always been some question about Buzz Aldrin, second man on the moon. What did he see? Mm -hmm. Uh, I've been with him on the Larry King show where he said, look, I I called it a UFO because I didn't know what it was. But I don't think it was a UFO, a spaceship, something like that. What's your take on that? You mean... Are there UFOs being cited on no on on, on Aldrin's comments? Oh, on Aldrin specifically, it seems like uh, all those guys, because he's a military officer first, he is sworn to uh, not violate J A N A P one hundred. I believe it was. It's a it's a it's a code, uh, and if you if he was to violate that, he would be fined and or imprisoned. Uh, for revealing any national security secrets re- pertaining to UFOs. That's pretty much well established in the public record. All right, back to covert encounters now in Washington, D.C. Any follow-up to your work there yet? Yeah, well, um, people are still reporting st- strange things. The most compelling stuff, that uh, the evidence that I'm seeing, is being gathered by Mr. Allen, who you've had on your show. Yeah. His website is ufodc.com. He's using the top of the line Nikon imaging equipment at night on top of his roof where he lives, seven blocks from the White House. He's getting this almost on a nightly basis. Whenever he puts the equipment up there, he's getting these objects coming in and out of prohibited airspace that simply shouldn't be there. And these are not conventional by any means. Uh, you can tell the difference. I mean, he's captured images of helicopters and planes. Um, let me tell you that Nikon, the top-line Nikon equipment is amazing. I mean, it can literally photograph stuff in the dark without any external light uh, or extra lighting. Um, but it, what's really strange on top of it all, as if that wasn't weird enough, someone, something has been remotely sabotaging his cameras. I mean, frying the motherboards, even crushing—that's weird. Even crushing the shutter, which it is titanium. It how how be, do they do that? It's some sort of remote energy uh, beam, and um, I don't know if it's our stuff or if it's the alien technology. As I told you before, there's clearly a, a conflict going on between these different factions, um, and that again is part of the historic record. Uh, so-called good versus evil, light versus dark. But, I mean, it's weird because, like, somebody obviously wants him to take the pictures, like almost like they're posing for him there at the Capitol and the Washington Monument and stuff. And then yet when he's doing this other thing at, at his on top of his roof, he's getting all these things. I think he told me it's happened five or six times now. And every time it happens, he called me up, and he's really upset, you know, and he can't understand – Oh, oh, and then I explained it to him. I said, hey, have you ever heard of the Hutchison effect? And he's like, I don't know what that is. So I sent him videos. Have you ever seen those videos? Oh, absolutely. Okay. And John's been on the show before. Okay, so you know. All right. But Will Allen had no idea until I showed him those videos, and and I said, that's how. You think it's crushed, but in fact it just like – not melted it. It's like – it's sort of like microwave uh, something from a distance. It's bizarre. It, it is. It is. But if you think about it, it kind of makes sense that, I mean, look, they're here, but we can't know about it. Right. Because supposedly it would destabilize society. I mean, that's what the Brookings. Institute that, that's the apparent it. fear. That's the yeah, that in, theory, in theory. But if they really wanted to just take over, uh, obviously, they could have done it. So, I mean, I don't see where the big problem is other than it would look our infrastructure would change radically if we were to have open contact with people that can travel through wormholes or across galaxies or a, n- a number of things. I know Michu Kaku's talked about this. We're not even at a zero, and here if we were to encounter civilizations that were type 1 or type 2, it would be mm, it, difficult. The transition is going to be rough no matter how you co- slice it. It's going, to be, it's going to be hard. Well, you know, Robert, I'm tipping that these visitations aren't friendly. And the the reason I say that is, mm-hmm. you know, to me, when you come in under the cloak of darkness, uh, mm-hmm. when you try to hide generally, yeah, because uh, they haven't made themselves well known, right. that, you know, you're up to something. And, you know, whether they're afraid that our societies would collapse, I don't think they're concerned about that. I think well, they're up no. to something and they don't want us really to know about it. No, and okay, for P, all right, let's just uh, summarize this real quick. I believe this planet was upgraded by benevolent extraterrestrials a long time ago. Maybe the Anunnaki, right? 
Fine, whatever you want to call them. I just say benevolent. I think that they are builders of worlds. I think they, they terraformed this into a paradise planet. Then came along some fallen ones that um, degraded this world, took it over, enslaved the, us, and turned us into something less than what we were before. So I'm expecting another intervention by the benevolent ones at some point to liberate us and bring us back to where we were. Or there'll be one heck of a war. (laughs) Well, it it seems like that's been kind of going on. uh, The reason I preface it that way is because it seems like that is what is going on already. There's a conflict, and that's one of the reasons the, the good guys don't just step out and have a press conference and say, hey, we're here, here's what we know. Here's who you really are, and here's what's happened and how you got here. And like I said, that would be a shock, but it would probably be a very healthy thing for us to uh, you know, have that experience. Well, what you just described, Robert, you mm-hmm. just described the uh, book of Genesis. In essence, and also the, uh, some of the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, it talks about the sons of darkness versus yeah. the sons of light. And uh, I know Edgar Mitchell is big on that. He's, he talks, about, he references that a lot because there's something to it. Um, but again, you know, here's the problem. Until we actually have a dialogue with these people in these crafts from wherever they may be, um, we're not going to get a straight answer. And even then, I think who, whatever they tell us, a fish, or, you know, someday uh, uh, on the record, we're going to have to vet that. We're going to have to say, prove it. You know, I mean, we can't just take their word for it. Uh, Because, like you said, there's so much covert nonsense going on right now, so much deception, probably cut some backroom deals with, uh, you know, the governments, not just our government. Um, I'll tell you what, the thing I've been working on, I didn't want to publicize this too much, but over – Oh, go ahead, Rob. Well, look, it's it's an extension. I thought I was done writing about Washington, D.C. I really – you know, two books, 800 pages. I thought, you know, and website, whatever. Yeah, enough is enough, right? You would think. You would think. But for some reason, this last Christmas, I was home, and I found myself looking into, very deeply falling into the whole, uh, what does the Pentagon really know? And I had to go back and look over thousands of reports, and then it started to dawn on me, man, they know – a lot more than they're willing to admit. In fact, they're absolutely petrified that these things are able to uh, intercept intelligence, know what they're actually thinking before they do it. And I mean, our guys, I'll give you an example. Like in in Florida, there was a, there were, there was a UFO hovering over a sensitive launch site. The commander says to one of the subordinates, fire on that craft. It's not, you know, it's, it's unauthorized. As soon as the guy goes to press the button to launch something at it, they disappear. Jeez. That means, <laughs> yeah, that means that they knew exactly. They were either intercepting the radio communication or they knew exactly what that individual was thinking because the, my understanding is telepathy is a real thing. Now they're saying we can actually do it with some sort of technology. It may be both, you know, it may be a natural uh, gift and, or it is a technology. But either way, we don't have the high ground. Okay, we really are not on, uh, we have no parity with these, these individuals in these craft. And that's been proven to our military time and time and time again. They have monitored, as you've, I'm sure you've talked to Robert Hastings about this, about the, uh, you know, how they tampered with mm-hmm. our most sensitive nuclear arsenal. A great story. But, well, it's not just a story. It's a fact. They didn't just do it to us. They did it to all the major uh, uh, missile, excuse me. They've monitored almost all major missile launches, especially to do with nuclear, as well as nuclear testing. UFOs are typically have been sighted for decades watching our development. Shut them down and turn them back on again. Yeah, now, that's the other thing. I would assume, I hope that I'm right, uh, that the good guys are intervening. I mean, look, if you, if you go back to what allegedly what Eisenhower was told back at Edwards Air Force Base in California back in the 1954, uh, they were these so-called benevolent tall Nordics were saying, look, we'll help you, but you've got to stop with the nuclear program. It's a dead end street. Well, that didn't work. No, it, well, no. I mean, it wasn't just up to Eisenhower. The, uh, what, whoever, the powers that be said no. And it could be the reason that these people are showing up and sabotaging and even sometimes stealing war, literally stealing warheads out of the missiles in Montana is because um, they don't they're, they're trying to keep us from killing ourselves. I don't know if that's it, Robert. I, well, how I mean, do you see it? I mean, honestly, I, they, they didn't stop us in 45. 
They haven't stopped the Koreans from doing what they're doing. That's I mean, true. if they really wanted to intervene, they dismantle everything right now. Well, there may be some restrictions. Again, I see, look, we're just speculating. We really don't know. We really don't know because we haven't had the conversation with them. But I'd, I'd like to briefly update everybody on what I've learned about the archons. Yeah. And how that fits into sure all thing. this. Those, sure. those mental parasites, some people say are demons, whatever. Um, they, they clearly are real, whether some people want to believe it or not. Yeah. No, it's up to them. But here's the thing. One of the techniques that, if, that somebody emailed me, and I, I've tried it. It's fantastic. If you measure your heartbeat, I mean literally find your pulse, and you, you synchronize your breathing to your heartbeat, you will, you will, it's like reset, rebooting. Your internal uh, rhythm becomes uh, normal again, normalized. Instead of being, instead of being, we're, we're, see, we're constantly being provoked, and that's what they want. That's what those things need us to be. So this is a very simple technique that anybody can apply at any time. It helps if you're in a nice, quiet place. Obviously, with the less distractions, the better. That's one thing. The other thing is. Um, a Native American shaman I'm friends with out here in New England gave me this tip, and I tried it recently, and it's, it's quite profound. If you recognize these things are hungry and they're trying to feed and they're constantly provoking you, you can turn the relationship around. You can actually empower yourself by saying, look, okay, I'll feed you. If next, time I'm feeding, uh, next time I'm feeling angry or scared, you can have that, but I'm not gonna, I am not going to continue doing this. I will feed you, but I, I refuse to be, be your uh, food source permanently. In other words, you take. In other words, instead of having them manipulate us covertly to get what they want, once you recognize what they're doing, and you you become in control, and you say, you know, like I'll give you an example. This is kind of silly, I know, but I, I'm a big uh, fanatic for tennis. I love playing the game, but when I get out there and things don't go well, if I play badly, I start getting angry at myself. <laughs> Do you throw the racket? Uh, no, my son does that a lot. Um, <laughs> but, but, but the point is, the point is, that's not play anymore. Okay, now I'm just, I'm just pissed off. And what's happening is, it's on a physical level, it's really, you know, it's very harmful. But on an energetic, spiritual level, it's, it's really harmful because now these things are coming around and feeding. So what I said to myself, hey, I'm going to try this technique going in. This time, I'm going to be in control. And sure enough, I'm out there and started laughing about it because I wasn't holding it, and I was playing better, and I was actually having fun. And my son actually – he started getting mad at me, like, what are you laughing? He thought I was laughing at him. And then I explained it to him, and he's like, that's crazy, Dad. And, you know, typical teenager, he's uh, – I love him, but he thinks I'm nuts. But, but the point is <laughs> – Every teenager thinks we're nuts. Uh, yeah, the parents are always wrong, right? You know, teenagers know everything. Yeah, we it, did the same thing, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, of course. But here's the thing. It works. Okay, I mean, I tried it for myself, and it works. And I'm just sharing that with people, that we have um, – we have a real uh, greater ability – then we know to to uh, shift this relationship so that it's not uh, detrimental to us, that they can actually serve a purpose um, to, to scavenge off a lot of the negative energy that, that pops up in our lives for whatever reason. Oh, one other thing that came up when I was studying this about the, the Catholic perspective on this is, is uh, the first stages of, the, of, of this problem is obsession with anything, whatever it be, sex, food, money, you know, whatever it is, drugs. Uh, that's the first step towards becoming possessed by these things. So I would caution people when you find what it just, you know, take an inventory, be honest with yourself. What is it that you're obsessed with? And if you say nothing, then I'm, you, gosh, you're a better person than I am. Because uh, I mean, I, I think most of us are conditioned to be obsessed with something. And again, this is something once you recognize it and you start taking control of it, You'll be a stronger individual, you'll be less vulnerable, and uh, you'll just be a better person overall. Robert, what keeps driving you? What's the passion here? Because you don't stop. No, I don't. Uh, no, it's, well, it's because of the fact that I was attacked by these things back in 1985. And when I, at the time, I didn't know what was going on, George. Honestly, oh, who would? I, I don't blame you. No, there was no context for it. I was a young man of 25, and I thought the world was, you know, I had a very, uh, quote unquote, normal view of, of life, you know. 
but uh, growing up in Malibu, right? I thought that was pretty cool. Anyway, I, that when that happened to me, and I went up on the mountain, and I prayed like my or meditated like whatever you want to call it. I I was up there because I was I needed an answer. I needed some help. And when I when I went out of my body um, and entered that realm of light and met that being who said he was, I think he said he was the father. In any case, I, you know, the, the bottom line is this. It was transformational. I couldn't undo it. And I'm pretty sure, in fact, I'm absolutely positive. That if I didn't have that experience, um, first of all, I would have never gone back and found those ancient ruins. I would have not started having uh, close encounters. I mean, multiple close encounters that continued even when I moved out here to New England. Um, and the bottom line is I've been trying to figure this out for myself. Thank you for listening to Coast to Coast AM on our official YouTube channel.